an Australian journalist who is interviewing you, Thomas, wrote, uh, from out-of-body experiences to lucid dreaming, anarchic hand syndrome to phantom limbs, his investigations have taken him to places few dare to go, be spooked, bewildered, amazed. And as I was reading that and reading all of you, I was re brought back to a conversation I once had with someone working in the field of cloning. And she described her field as the realm of fiction science. But I think what we're about to start discussing here is another realm of fiction science, but these are inner frontiers, right? Um, inner frontiers of mind, consciousness, self, will inner worlds that may amaze and even perhaps frighten us. But Thomas, I'd like to start with you. Um, I think that you, uh, among the, uh, of the three of you, are the most resolute in insisting that the self is an illusion. And so I wonder if you would just start by telling us what you mean by that and how you, how you came to that. Well, I wouldn't put it like that. Uh, people who like to intoxicate themselves in New Age bookstores they like concepts like that self is an illusion. But if one looks a little closer, the first question one would have would be, who is having this illusion? So this illusion talk itself is conceptually problematic. If I had to stay with it, I would rather say it's an illusion that's no one's illusion or something like that. Um, I think it is pretty obvious that there is no such thing as a self. As you know, philosophers all disagree all the time, but there's a pretty uh, strong consensus in my discipline that the self is not a substance. It's not a provocative uh, claim, it's actually something almost trivial. A substance for philosophers is something that could hold itself in existence, is ontologically self-subsistent, as we say, that could maintain its own being, say, also in the absence of a living brain or something like that. And that the self is not a thing in the brain or a thing outside of this world, that seems pretty obvious to most of my colleagues. I would say what is very robust and very real is what we call the phenomenal self. Of course, there is a self that appears in conscious experience. I feel like I'm someone. But that is not a thing, but a process. That process right. is very different during the dream state. In dreamless deep sleep, there is no phenomenal self, no self as experienced. And now, I hope at least all of you uh, enjoy this, as we call phenomenal selfhood. And I think, in its essence, this process is a representational process. So what we call a self or the self in folk psychological discourse is actually a reified time slice of an ongoing process in which your brain makes an image of you, your body, your emotional state, your memories, your plans, your social relationships, and so forth. So, not an entity, but a process. You have uh, used the metaphor that the, that the ego is like a, that consciousness is like a tunnel. Ex right. Explain what you mean by that. Well, I think the knowledge we have about the world, and we do have knowledge about the external world, is a very real phenomenon. But if we just speak about consciousness in the sense of how it appears to us subjectively, it is a locally determined phenomenon. Uh, to cut a long story short, I think if all the properties of your brain are fixed, what you will consciously experience will also be fixed too. So in that sense, it is an inward phenomenon. But what I'm Getting at, you know, I've been in this consciousness community for many years uh, with working with neuroscientists and philosophers. Consciousness is not one problem. It's a whole bundle of problems. But there is something like a deepest issue, a core issue. And that is the question is, who has all these states? And who or what is this self that lives through all these experiences? And that's how I come to this. Uh, that's why I'm interested uh, in all of this. And as it turns out, to have a phenomenal self is a, a process that's very highly dependent and determined by information processing in your brain, for instance. It's the content of an image. And if I just may say that one thing, the special thing about your self model right now, about the self model active in all of your brains right now, is that it is as philosophers say, transparent. That means 
you cannot experience it as an image. So you are not only naive realists about everything you see, the colors and the objects, but also about the content of the self-model that is active in your brain right now. You identify with this image. It's like you're glued or attached to its content. And that's why you have the mistaken idea that you're someone. Um, so you've said that the conscious self that navigates reality is a computational tool. So really, we were all living in virtual reality all along, but just now invented the concept. And that creates this interesting, I mean, the interesting sense of inwardness. It's not just that it is something in the brain or in a reality model of the brain. What I'm trying to get at is this subjective quality of inwardness, because that seems to be the essence of the mystery to me. And it is a mystery. It... Yes, but I think we have the conceptual tools at hand mm -hmm. to understand how it could come about. How could any information processing system, a natural system that has no self or no sharp identity, develop the robust experience that it is a self and has an identity through time? That's what I'm interested mm -hmm. in. And but and absolutely biologically rooted and dependent. Well, no, I think uh, the human conscious self doesn't only have neural correlates, it also has social correlates. The human self model is very special in many respects, different from those our animal ancestors have. There's a part that's not transparent, we're not fully caught in illusion. It has strong social correlates. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a very important um, aspect of it. But there's an inbuilt conflict in the human self model. We have this emotional layer, which has a very strongly inborn biological imperative, and that is you must not die. You have to survive, you know. Those who didn't have that, they weren't our ancestors. And uh, then we have this brand new, slow cognitive self model, our frontal lobe, that doesn't work so well as we all know, but that makes us the first animal on this planet to have a clear, conscious, and explicit knowledge of the fact that we will die. So there is an inbuilt, I don't know how I would say this in, in English, a, a chasm or a schism or a split in our self-model. And that creates this constant attempt in beings like us to become whole again, to heal ourselves, to somehow reconcile with what we know, with what we feel just must not be true under all any circumstance, namely that we are mortal beings. Mm -hmm.